another traveler. Pull a chair up and rest your feet. Would you care for some food or a drink? Perhaps some information or a legendary tale. Come, stay a while and listen. Welcome to Tavern Legends, episode three of Table Talk. I'm Clayton Friedemann. And I'm Jacob Yambor. And today we are going to be discussing Dungeons and Dragons and how to get into it as a player. Um, so first we're going to be breaking down what exactly Dungeons and Dragons is before going into some steps that we think are necessary that you should follow in, in order to get into the role-playing game. Absolutely. So... First, first point out, we're going to talk about what is Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. Uh, Jake, you want to say a little word about what Dungeons and Dragons is? So Dungeons and Dragons, at its core, is a tabletop role-playing game. You get together with a small group of people, and you do this storytelling, adventuring, and teamwork experience. It involves sometimes traveling in mythical worlds, or if you right. want to do something that's more of a based in the real world there's options for that too Mm -hmm. Uh, you take on the persona of a character Mm -hmm. and this character you represent going forward in a session yeah you essentially take on the life of this character where you live out their adventures their experiences um, their lives if you get that deep into it or it can be something as simple as just a random group of adventures just and that's all they are. Yeah, maybe just dungeon delve, or you're looking for treasure. It's mm-hmm. it can be as broad or as narrow of an experience as you want it to be. Mm-hmm. And the game set up that way. There's multiple editions of the game of Dungeons and Dragons itself. I should say, we're going to be focusing in on fifth edition on this on this podcast episode. But there are numerous. There's fourth edition before this. There's three point five. There's third. There's Advanced D&D 2nd Edition and Advanced D&D 1st Edition. Yep, yep. And then to go on a tangent altogether, there's still other types of systems that are similar to Dungeons & Dragons. Sometimes people even refer to them as D&D, but they are still part of a D20 system, which relies on a 20-sided die to determine if you succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. Um, Some examples of those might be Pathfinder, Starfinder... Call of Cthulhu, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are other rule sets out there. Uh, at the core, they are a tabletop game that relies on storytelling and adventuring with a group of people. Yeah, it's just usually in a different setting. Like Dungeons & Dragons is primarily fantasy, whereas Starfinder would be stars, High outer fantasy space. versus sci-fi mm-hmm. versus horror, that kind of stuff. I mean, you can still do that with Dungeons yeah. & Dragons, but a lot of the stuff that has already been made available yep. is focused on the high fantasy yeah, we we love dungeons and dragons but we just want to make it aware to beginners it's not the only place to start absolutely but it's a great place to start yep so yep. we're going to start probably hinting on some points then what do you say absolutely let's do this okay so to start off let's just review the points we're going to cover tonight first up we're going to talk about finding a dm and a dedicated group of players. Then, we're going to talk about making sure you or someone in your group has the necessary materials to play a game. And finally, we'll wrap it up with talking about character creation, which is a big part of the game. Oh, for sure. That's kind of how you are in the game, represented. Yeah. Correct. Um, so I guess first we'll start out with the first step then, finding a dungeon master and a dedicated group of players. So... I just want to go out on a limb here and say we've been fortunate as a group, as Tavern Legends group, to easily find a group to play with. It started with me and my brother getting me into role playing and then me just kind of edging my friends into it. Yeah, he pretty much recruited us into this little cult. I should... <laughs> 
Yeah, but we started off as kids, and we've just been playing ever since. So we got really lucky in that we have a long-term group that we've just stuck around with. So to talk about finding a new group, it's a little bit of a different situation. Mm-hmm. And we've had many people come and join. We've had many people leave. You know, it's just it's the, it's the way the game is. Um, but this is definitely one of the harder steps, I'd say. Um, but there's always, there's always people out there if you're willing to look and ask around and find a group of great people to play with. Yep. Um, so some suggestions that we kind of brainstorm together here are local game stores in your community. You could go somewhere, for example, in Nebraska where we are, Lincoln, Nebraska, there's local stores like Hobby Town or Gauntlet Games. Games. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes in these stores they have this thing called Adventure League, um, that's a great way to get into Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, mm-hmm. It is an option where it's typically ran by people in some way affiliated with Wizards of the Coast. They they're given the rights to run this league yeah. in their store, so it's an organized play, and anybody can jump in whenever you want. And basically, you just have to have an adventure league legal player mm-hmm. or character to play in there right and they usually will had would have maybe something ready to go there for you yeah for example like a character already pre-rolled yeah so. if, if you really didn't know what you're doing mm-hmm. they often have that available yeah so that's that's a that's a big option looking around at your local game stores and communities um another big one you probably already guessed it online yes online communities obviously they're big right now it's you can find almost anything online for a group right mm-hmm well, why not Dungeons & Dragons? D&D, good old D&D. Uh, there are a lot of different sites to try. You can do social media and just post and start looking. Um, like Facebook, group, I know I found groups that are just looking for a group. Mm-hmm. Twitter kind of is the same way. Twitter. Uh, Reddit is a big one too. Mm-hmm. So just go ahead and browse social media for local communities that can use to find someone else to play. Yeah, or there's even online virtual playing where essentially you are brought in on a webcam yeah and you play with a group of other people from around the country and the world um that are also webcamming in and you guys play that way this is probably something you'll see more on like the live stream kind of games Mm -hmm. um they typically each have their own little monitor that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. as opposed to like critical role for example they all do the same room so yeah, that is not as common, I would say, just from my experience. Going to school is another option that we we discovered here. That's kind of how we got into it as a, as a group and everything. Right. There's going to be your friends there. There's going to be clubs as well. Yeah. So I mean, in our situation, we started off in grade school and high school. Mm-hmm. So maybe that'll work out for some of you. But chances are you're a little bit older, and maybe you're looking at university or community college, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and look around and see what kind of clubs might be out there. There's, Branch there's out. all kinds of groups and organizations for random things. Look I'm for sure, flyers, post a flyer. Absolutely. I'm sure with how popular the game is, you're bound to find somebody who wants to try the game. Right. Uh, going into work next, uh, that's another good place to find some people who either play Dungeons & Dragons. With. Yeah. Sometimes you can get a group to actually, like, do something over their lunch break and those mm-hmm. are great for just little short sessions that you get to know your coworkers better that kind of stuff but that you know might not work out for everyone nope. so maybe you just recruit your coworkers to join the game outside of work which is a great opportunity to maybe start socializing a little bit more mm-hmm. so that's a good option but maybe that doesn't work for everyone so another option might be to just look at your family Yep, go right in, ask your parents, ask your brother, ask your sister. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't matter, anyone in your family, you know. um, Maybe they want to get into the game just as bad as you do. Yeah, Uh, I managed to get my cousins to start playing a little bit. Uh, We don't play that often, but every once in a while we get together and do a little game. Mm -hmm. Or if we go on vacation together, I bring the books out and we'll do like two or three nights on vacation. It's always fun. And I did one with my brother for his bachelor party and that was was a good time. See, so there's all kinds of opportunities to squeeze in some Mm -hmm. D&D. There are examples of families that have really made it big time. You can always look up the McElroy Brothers and the Adventure Zone podcast. It is a riot of a time. They are hilarious. 
And it's a great example of what D and D can be, mm-hmm. especially for them. They go into it not knowing what the game is, and it's a good beginner's approach for mm-hmm. the game. So, and who knows? Maybe you, your group and your friends and your players eventually will be consider each other family at the end of your guys's right uh, role playing fun times. Yep. Um, and then I guess to wrap this up in terms of places you might be able to find a group, there are gaming conventions to look at. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I what would be some examples, Clay? Uh, I would have to say you could go to PAX Unplugged. I know that's more of an electronic one. Um, I can't think of the the major one that that goes on off the top of my head right now. Um, but there's there's definitely a good amount of gaming conventions. Anyone you go to, even we've been to a couple um, anime conventions, one yeah. in Sandusky and another in Chicago, and both times there, there was Dungeons and Dragons representation. Yep. And Comic-Cons and that kind of stuff, too. Mm-hmm. So it's it's all over the place. So chances are, if you're going to a big convention, <laughs> assuming it's not business, like accounting or whatever, software yeah. development, that kind of stuff, chances are you'll find D&D there. Yeah, but maybe if you ask someone at a convention like that, they'll be like, that's Let's another go play point. some Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. There you go. <laughs> you never know. So there's there's a lot of people that are out that are willing to play Dungeons and Dragons out there in this current age, and um, that kind of brings back brings us back full circle to our point where you need to find a dungeon master and a dedicated group of players. What that means essentially is you're going to need to have a group of people where you can work out a schedule together. You know, one hour up to however many hours you want to play eight hours 12 hours yeah however long you want to go and you need to find this group that's going to play with you through that and then the dm that is willing to run that for those players using his time as well yes it is it is a significant commitment to when you actually want to get a good game going Mm-hmm. It's something to remember, and it goes both ways. Your group has to be dedicated, and you as a player have to be dedicated. Yep. And I think it's also important to remember that you need to have a certain sense of comfortability with them. Like you don't want to be feeling like they might betray you or something like that. So if you feel like you're in a kind of toxic situation or whatever, it's probably not worth sticking around for everyone Maybe just find a new group, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But if it's just a little hard, it might be worth sticking it out. Yeah, you never, yeah. Know. So never like, know. We've recruited some newer players, and at first I was a little suspicious of how they might turn out. And right. then the next session, all of a sudden, they're really into it. They're loving the game. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you just got to get a little time. Yep. But. Yeah, and like we said in this podcast, we're going to be focusing more on the player aspect the Dungeon Master aspect, you can plan on listening to that in our next podcast episode, actually, too. So, Yes. Um, I think that kind of wraps up our first point there. Um, i say we kind of move into the second point now. All right, so that second point is going to be making sure you or someone in your group has the necessary materials to play this fantasy role-playing game. Yes, uh, sir. Jake, what would you like to say about the first point we have here? I think the most important thing you're going to need is a source book. So you're going to need, in our case, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Player's Handbook. This is going to have the basics for how to play the game, how to make your character, how to go through a session, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be your most important thing right there. Yep. After that handbook, there's a monster manual as well. This is going to contain monsters, beasts, and NPCs that you can introduce into your Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game and use them to drive the story forward, attack the party to cause harm, and all those sorts of things. This is where those stat blocks are going to be for those creatures. That's going to be a little more towards the Dungeon Master side of stuff. For sure. But there are situations where you, as a character, Mm -hmm. you might be... For an example, you might be a wizard and you're summoning a creature to fight for you. Mm-hmm. So you might need to flip open the monster manual. So exactly. So that could be a useful tool for you still. Mm-hmm. And that Dungeon Master is going to need the DM's Guide as well. The Dungeon, dungeon Master's, Master's Guide. Yep. Yep. The, but for our situation in the Player's Guide, we'll skip over that part for yeah, now. Yeah, we'll be covering that more, like I said, in our Dungeon Dungeon Master podcast later next yes. episode. So. Yes. Uh, okay, so the next tool you will need in your arsenal, you're going to want some dice. 
Mm -hmm, definitely. They can be as cheap or as fancy as you want them to be. But the basic set is going to consist of a D20, which is a 20-sided die. This is going to be the one that you use for determining most actions uh, if you succeed or fail. This is like the most important die. For sure. The next die size is a D12 or a 12-sided die. Yep. This one is not as common, but it is still used for some of the weapons and stuff like that, maybe spells. Um, the next die is going to be the D10. The 10-sided die is a little more commonly used. And then we have the D8, 8-sided, mm -hmm. D6. The D6 is the 6-sided die, which you are used to seeing in... Gambling. Monopoly. Yeah. Gambling. So yeah. that is and that is one of the more common die in the game. Yep. Definitely is used quite a bit. Yep. And the final one, the sharpest of them all, the one that you do not want to step on. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee that. The D four. This dice is a triangular pyramid shaped dice that is essentially one through four on it. Yeah. There are situations where there's another style. Looks yep. almost like a barrel. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to describe it. But yep. you, you roll it on its side. But for our purpose, we tend to use the pyramid. And going back to the D10 a little bit, it has two styles too. It has a normal one and then one that has two zeros on it. It's kind of a percentage. Yes. You can use them both to determine percentages in the game. That's a little bit more complex and everything. I wouldn't focus on that too much as a beginner. But as a DM, we'll talk a little bit more about that for sure. Yep. Um, but those are some pretty important things are getting dice and you're probably wondering where you can get those. Like we mentioned earlier at a game store, um, online as well. And once you see the dice that you want, you'll be drawn to them. There's an energy that just pulls yes. you in. It calls to you. I don't know why, but just playing Dungeons and Dragons, our group, at least we, we're a little bit addicted to the dice, so it can be a fun part of the game. So the next thing to consider is having a place to play. Yep, that's important. So in this approach, you'll have to make sure you're paying attention to, are you going to be playing in person? Or are you going to be playing online? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're playing online, having a physical place to play isn't quite so important, just as long as you have your computer set up, yeah. you know, maybe a microphone and headphones, that kind of thing. Yep. And just a little space to roll out your dice, maybe take some notes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Nothing too complex. Yeah, definitely, definitely going to want to be taking notes during this this time. Yeah, um, it can it can be a very life saving in the game sometimes. It so. can. Sometimes you might have a little clue that was left behind by the dungeon master, and it, you need to pull it back. Mm -hmm. So make sure you take notes. Yep. But to jump on the other side of where you would play a physical place, right? So this is a little bit different. Sometimes this can be pretty hard for people, especially if you're living in a smaller apartment or whatever. So mm -hmm. what would be some suggestions from you, Clay? I would say your local game stores are going to have a good place to play. Um, maybe a library. You can get a little quiet room and play in one of those little rooms they have there. Um, if you go to a school, you might be able to rent out a little room or something like that to play, like a little club area, stuff like that. That's some That's some pretty good... Um, suggestions i have yeah I like um, those. places you can play board games bars sometimes work for some people yeah some some of the bigger cities are even starting to have D, &D themed bars and tabletop game bars mm -hmm. where you just go in and have a drink and you play board games and stuff so mm -hmm. i'm sure those places would be more than willing to accommodate a group of players yeah so once you got that place to stay pretty much the last thing you're gonna need it's going to be that character sheet. This is going to be where you jot everything down. This is your Bible, essentially. Yeah. Do not lose your character sheet. You will lose your character sheet, though, inevitably. <laughs> At least we always have seemed to lose, like, one or two. Yeah. Yeah. But Don't do that. <laughs> try not to. Uh, but a character sheet. This is where you're keeping your character stats, your stuff like your name, what race, what class you are, and right. your ability scores. We'll break that down a little bit more in the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also going to have stuff like your equipment, your skills, and this is sometimes people will keep some notes on the character sheet as well. Yeah, exact. Like example would be maybe your character backstory or maybe some notes about an enemy you ran into, for example. Yeah, these are good examples. Um, so those are kind of all the necessary materials. I think we hit on them. Is there any more really that you can think of at this moment? I felt that's a good 
beginner's overlook at mm-hmm. the tools you will need to play Dungeons it's, and Dragons. It's important, and, and we can't stress the source books enough. You're going to want to play those if you want to play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. You're definitely going to want that. So make yep. sure make sure you have those source books. Um, you can oh, get them at the game stores. This will be a good time to drop. There is online tools for those source right. books as well. Don't forget that. You can find the basic rule set for 5th edition online already for free. Mm-hmm. This is not going to have as much to it. Um, right. I think it just has four basic yeah, subclasses it's kind of for just, each. Like yeah, there's very the fighter, rogue, cleric, and meat, wizard. Meat, meat and potatoes. you just get the one type. Mm-hmm. If you get the actual handbook, there's a few options for each class. Mm-hmm. And as a group, we use Dungeons & Dragons Beyond. I'm going to throw a plug in for D&D them. Beyond. Right, yeah, D&D Beyond. Dun- we're just so we're trying to hit that home for all the beginners. It's Dungeons and Dragons, but I think you get it. So D and D Beyond, um, it's a great tool. The books come at about twenty dollars, roughly a piece, and Somewhere it's gonna there. yeah twenty five. Mm-hmm. Just you know five dollars. It's it's something. gonna get you into the game quick if you're looking for a a way to store everything digitally and you don't want to take up bulk space with the books that cost about 50 a pop. So yeah, there are other options. Rule 20 is an example. They mm-hmm. have, a, they have other stuff available too. Like you can buy quests or whatever. Yep. So, um, th- something to consider when you are doing this, the physical books do not have like a copy code or whatever. So it is a separate thing. You're not going to be able to buy the physical book and then use D and D beyond or rule yeah, 20 with correct. that book. I mean, like you can jump online and, get on and play with a group using your book but you won't mm-hmm. have the online tool yeah so right we, we have both we like the physical books just because you know the feel of a book is great and sometimes when you're at the table it's better to just pull out the book yep. and talk over the book instead of having a computer screen right. in front of your face or whatever yeah so those are some alternatives and some not i wouldn't say necessary parts but the source books definitely but where you get them kind of just is up to you guys we just wanted to give you some suggestions and tips like that that we've learned throughout our time playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. So, I I'll guess wrap up our second point. We're making sure you, you or someone in the group has the necessary materials. Now, to wrap up the episode here, we're going to talk about for our third step, character creation. A big one. This is a lot of the time spent doing your setup for a game. So to cover this quickly, there is going to be race, class, ability scores, skills, background, and equipment. So that's that's the list of things you're going to have to cover before your character is ready. Ready for creation, ready to get into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. So do you want to touch a little bit on the on the race initially in there? Yeah, I'll talk about race. So race in D and D is a lot more broad than what we refer to as race it's not talking about black and white it's talking about elves dwarves humans that kind of thing if you get out the player's handbook you'll see a lot of these options available they'll have descriptions about the story of them like elves are kind of more of a magical people and they're long-lived where humans are more of a hard-working and they have a lot shorter lives i mean they have our normal lifespan but they're also the ones that can seem to do anything they they put their mind to. So right. it's a pretty broad spectrum of what a race encompasses. Mm-hmm. And usually, typically, if you can imagine it or have seen it in a fantasy setting, chances are it's probably in Dungeons & Dragons, at least for the most part. Yeah, I would say, especially for D&D, a good example of what races are going to be like in the game you can look mm-hmm. at Lord of the Rings. It's, yeah. I mean, it's pretty heavily influenced by it. You, Gary Gygax has talked about this. The creator of the game has talked about this before. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for inspiration, you can always just pop in the Lord of the Ring movies and right. have a quick watch. So I would say your race is definitely the, the first main thing you want to figure out. It's going to drive kind of your background a little bit, maybe what kind of class you want to say. It's going to have some descriptions in the book of... Uh, and I should say um, that I should say suggestions of classes yeah. that you can play with that, which kind of gets into our next point here, which is class. Choosing your class. That is like choosing if you are going to be a fighter. Are you going to be a wizard? This is basically where you declare your degree. Yeah, like <laughs> your major in college. So yeah, we let's 
let's cover them quickly here. There is, from the start, there's Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Fighter. Druid. Forgot the Druid, my bad. No, he's forgotten all the time. <laughs> he's a sneaky one. Uh, we got the Rogue, the Ranger. Paladin. Paladin, Wizard, Warlock. And did you, you said ranger, so, yep. yep I th- and you said monk? Oh, I skipped the monk. Monk. The monk is one the monk. of the newer ones that showed up, yep. I think, in third edition. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a cool one. But those are essentially all the classes, and these are going to tie into your race, like I said. So kind of figuring these first two things out are going to be the core of your character. Like, what kind of character do you want to play? Your race and your class are going to determine that essentially right mm-hmm. out the gate. Like, do you want to be a small agile rogue do you want to go in and be like a hobbit and sneak around and then pick locks stuff like that that so you choose like a halfling rogue so that's just kind of a little bit of an example and we're gonna have some more examples at the end but race and class are very important these are your main two Mm -hmm. that will bring you to the table and it can be a little intimidating at first there are a lot of options but Try not to focus on that. Just think about the character that you want to create. You know, don't sit there and look through all the rules. You'll, I mean, if unless you want to, but you you'll get, be sitting there. If you'll get lost. Yeah, it's easy to get overwhelmed if you mm-hmm. try to take on too much in one go. So if you feel like, <clears throat> I mean, if you if you have something in mind that is already kind of an image ready to go, just mm-hmm. go for it. Yeah. Play the game. Try it out. You're like, I want to be a noble knight. Boom, human fighter, or a paladin. One of the two. Done. Either one works. You got two yeah. options right there with a whole bunch of options stemming from that. Yep. So the next thing we want to cover is ability scores. What These are ability scores? Ability scores are the basic six scores that right. define what your character is like. Right. What they're what they're good at, what they're bad at, what their strengths, weaknesses are, stuff like that. This can also be used to help describe an image of your character a little bit so for yep. example a strong barbarian is going to have a higher strength a higher constitution and chances are he's going to have a lower intelligence that's usually the way it is yeah so let's <laughs> let's cover these ability scores real quick uh clay you want to start us yeah you already mentioned three of them strength constitution and intelligence the other three that we are missing in there are going to be wisdom, charisma, and dexterity. Right. So So, yeah, breaking them down, breaking them down individually. Strength, like Jake mentioned just a few minutes ago, that's going to be your strength, brawn, your buffness. Are you that Arnold Schwarzenegger buff guy? Your might. Mm Mm-hmm. Dexterity. That's going to be more. How quick and nimble are you? Can you? nimbly pick this lock while being under duress from attack from afar or can you dodge this fireball coming at you something like that yes so the next one constitution let's talk about constitution this one's a little more abstract it's Mm -hmm. not as like easy to compare to it's your hardiness uh, how durable you are sometimes in games this one gets a little bit more confused it's not as common of a skill you could say yeah but it is really important for your hit points in determining how strong you are, like how much damage you can take. Yeah, it's can you withstand poison if you are a spellcaster and you're trying to concentrate on a spell and you get hit in mm-hmm. battle or outside of battle, this is your ability to withstand that and still concentrate on that spell. And it's also your ability to withstand the elements. Like if it's right. really hot and you're getting overheated or if it's really cold and your body's freezing or... Mm-hmm trying to hold your breath so it's it's pretty broad and actually it, it yeah covers. it's broad but it's 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 one of those that it's just yeah like you said your hardiness your your willingness to try to persevere if you will inner spirit I mean, there's, yeah, in a, there's a, way, a lot of ways to describe it inner spirit could also be your wisdom yep so wisdom is your you know how wise are you how in tune with things around you it's your intuition Mm -hmm. do you know how stuff works are you perceptive do you hear things that others don't do you smell things that others 
can't smell. Do you get a good read on people? Are you able to like tell, is this person of good intent? That kind of stuff. Yeah, like, is this person want to hurt me or are they here to help me? Wisdom is kind of that intuition where you can pick up on that type of uh, situation. And it also ties into how well you can perceive things too. Yeah. Your senses in, in that aspect. And then we have intelligence. This one's pretty self-explanatory, kind of mm -hmm. like strength. This is how smart your character is. Yep. Uh, how much they know about facts and information as opposed to feelings. Wisdom is a little more on the feeling side mm -hmm. of stuff. And intelligence is book smart. Yeah, like uh, if you have to investigate something, you would use intelligence as opposed to wisdom. Right. Or uh, intelligence is an important one for wizards. Mm -hmm, That's where definitely. they get most of their features from. And that's also maybe you're going to be appraising an item to get a gauge on how much is this really worth. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes a dungeon master will be like, hey, you know, use an intelligence to see if you can figure out this clue for a puzzle, that kind of stuff. Right. And the last one is going to be charisma. And this one's a kind of another broad one here. It's a little more abstract. Um, you're going to be... Charisma is essentially your likability, how much people want to it's approach your, you. Your presence. Your overall demeanor. What do you look like? Are you attractive? Are you unattractive? Some people might argue that's not part of it. Some might argue it is part of it. It's just kind of up to you as a group. But that's kind of what charisma is, your ability to talk out of a situation, like Han Solo style. Something. Are you charming? Are you charming? Yeah. Can you attract a mate at the bar and bring her back to your room? Stuff like that. Um, that's, that's charisma in a nutshell, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, so that's ability scores. Let's talk about skills. What are skills, Clay? Skills. So these kind of tie into your ability scores in a lot of ways. These are going to be abilities like um, talking your way out of a situation, bluffing, if you will, or Persuasion. your athletics, athletics, jumping around, or disarming a trap. That's going to be maybe dexterity based or using some sort of tools, stuff like that. This is like skills that your character specializes in. There's a large list of them. Um, there's Let's, Arcana. I'm not going to go over them all, but there's essentially you need a way to do things in the game, and skills is the way of of solving that problem in front mm -hmm. of you. Yeah, the the skills are how you interact with the world in front of you, and uh, there are going to be situations where it's not explicitly laid out like this skill does this. You know, mm -hmm. Sometimes you just got to go by feel, mm -hmm. and the dungeon master might say use this skill. And if you feel like, you know, maybe that's not the right skill for this situation, you can suggest it, a different skill. But it is important to keep in mind, the dungeon master is the one who has to run the game. Mm -hmm. So you default to their ruling and maybe talk about it after the session if you want to debate it more, right. that kind of thing. But basically, skills are the, the tools you use to interact with the world. Yeah. If you need to climb across a chasm, athletics check. If you need to run on a wall, acrobatics check. That kind of stuff. There, is, there's yeah. a check for that. You know, like they say, there's an <laughs> app for that. There's a skill for that. So um, that covers skills. Yeah, that definitely covers skills. So after you kind of get those four things nailed down, um, it, we're kind of going to go back to the role play element of your character, your race, your class. This ties into this a little bit more, and it's your background. Your background is going to be where you came from, like your ethnicity. It's going to really make you diverse and different from everyone or the same as someone else in, in, in your group. Yeah, this is where maybe the stereotype comes into play. Like, you want to play that noble knight. There is a background that is called the noble. Mm -hmm. And it just like it sounds, you come from like a noble family or something. And it gives you a certain set of features. The noble, for example, you're going to get a little bit more money and a little more prestige and like a rank, a title kind of position. Yeah. And as well, some skills that they're good at. They get bonus skills. Yeah, each background gets uh, a skill or a tool or a language, something like that, that fits the theme of the background. Right. So this is where you'll start to kind of picture a little bit more in your head of who do I want to be? Yeah, are you a tax collector from the city? 
Are you a town guard on the, that watches at night? Are you a, night? a wilderness survivor? Are you a guardsman? Do you do mercenary work? That kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much going to wrap up your whole character as a being and what they stand for. Um, and kind of just that, that'll come to fruition. And then after that, kind of the last thing is what kind of equipment are you going to be use while, using while you're adventuring? You've got to accessorize, man. you got to accessorize. you got to get that nice-looking greatsword. Yep. So um, most classes and backgrounds will have what is called starting equipment attached to them. Mm-hmm. That is one option. That's the quick way to do it. So if you're not really sure what you're going to need, and just it, choose the starting equipment. Yeah, and honestly, most most times it turns out that's what you usually choose. In the- <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a few times where it might be a little bit different, but um, the other option is you get starting gold. Uh, Mm -hmm. This one is based on class. There's a little chart. I cannot remember the page of the player's handbook right now, but I believe it's at the start of the equipment section. Each class has an assigned kind of range. Mm -hmm. You roll your dice, and that determines how much gold you start with. So sometimes, you know, that can actually start playing into the background more, Mm -hmm. where maybe you started as a noble and then you roll your gold and you got two ones on the dice so like mm-hmm. you're a poor noble so maybe that ties into the idea of that's why you're adventuring you're a poor noble and you have to get out into the world that kind mm-hmm. of thing and then i would say after you get your equipment and everything taken care of your next step would be kind of working with your dungeon master and trying to tie you into the story and how you fit in what's your what's your background or what's your end why are you coming to this town to adventure or you know, maybe get a little bit of that uh, going. It's not necessary, but um, it's it's a good step to definitely talk to your DM about. And he might approach it about you too, and we'll talk about that yeah. in our next episode. I, I think it's important to just have an idea or be flexible. If you don't mm-hmm. have an idea, then be open to how they might fit into the world. Yeah. So we're going to, like we promised you, we're going to do some character uh, uh, examples that, that we've created from our personal games ourselves. So we'll start with... Jake over here, I think he wants to kick us off with one of his favorite characters he's yeah, played. This is from our Out of the Abyss game. Uh, boy, did I enjoy this character. I had a Goliath fighter, and he was he kind of was a little bit of the stereotypical big brute, sort of. Um, he had a, an honorable streak, so if somebody challenged him to a duel, he was going to try and finish it. Mm-hmm. And I just loved playing him. It's, as straightforward as it was, there were times where like everybody is trying to encourage me to like just do the like there is that slime for example and it's like my weapon wasn't working well against it and everybody's like just switch your weapons and i'm like my goliath is stubborn he's bullheaded Mm -hmm. and i'm still doing damage so i'm just gonna keep chucking away chucking away and i'm gonna keep cutting it that was one of those moments where i was just yeah that's you know i felt like my character for a bit there Mm -hmm. really got into him so one of my favorite characters, um, I mentioned him in an earlier podcast episode, Tyrion Thistlebottom. He is a gnome wizard, so he's a bit of a smaller, mischievous guy, but he's very intelligent. He loves to learn. He He's from the Candlekeep area where he studied and learned his magic and his craft, and now he's on this adventure to try to find forbidden magics that help shape reality and help bring... Um, different types of realities and just to him and others to make sure that they just are confused and not sure what's going on around them like I love this character he's a kooky old guy he's just walking around and I always like to come up with the character voices so he's just talks a little funny he's just a little Tyrion Thistlebottom man and he goes around and grabs his fizzle papas and his whizzle poops and he builds his crafts and he does all the good stuff I think you touched on a good point there. Um, Sometimes you'll hear people take on a character voice. Now, this isn't something that's required, Mm -hmm. but it is a good way of doing two things. It puts you in the mind of your character because you're Mm -hmm. actually, you know, when you start talking like them, you're thinking like them a little bit more. But then it also does a good job of 
saying something in character is perhaps what you're actually saying as an adventurer versus mm-hmm. when you're switching out of your character voice right you might just be making a joke or talking to the table like oh wait what's that that kind of thing. saying something in general did you have a special ability but whatever mm-hmm. it may yeah and and it kind of ties into the dungeon master too like they run a lot of characters they might have a ton of voices you don't need to it just kind of enhances the role play so for example, I have a character, um, Malakoth Mordrak. He's a drow, which is a dark elf. He's a ranger. He loves the wilderness. He has a beast companion that can actually talk. He's awoken this beast. It's so intelligent, it can speak to him now. That's how strong their bond has become with these characters. Absolutely love this character. Malakoth's like a, like a Geralt witcher. He's very dry and emotionless. He's just kind of like, yeah, I suppose I can help you. And then you got... Shador, who just recently got awoken and started talking, and now he's got a voice where so it's just him having a conversation. It's like, Shador, what do you want to eat? Oh, yes, I'll have some good shrimp today, Malakoff. <laughs> All right, shrimp sounds good. So just kind of some ideas there of how, how to use your voice. Yep. Um, but I think we've touched on almost every point today. We went over some character examples like we wanted to say with you guys. Uh, so Jake, let's sign off. What do you say? All right, let's review our points again. So first up, we talked about getting together a group of dedicated players. Then mm-hmm. we talked about making sure someone in the group has the materials you need to play the game. And finally, we wrapped it up with character creation. So that about sums it up for uh, character creation and how to become a player in Dungeons and Dragons. So with all those points that we just covered, you should now be ready to start your Dungeons & Dragons adventure. If you guys have any questions for us on how to start your adventure or anything in this podcast, you can hit us up on Twitter, at Tavern Legends, or on Facebook, uh, where you can find our page, Tavern Legends. Yes, sir. So, thanks for joining us, travelers. We wish you fair weather and legendary adventures.